Uh, and aside from these, uh, perhaps a segue, I think we can make some really interesting uh, uh, conversations, interesting points of view. Uh, I don't know if into the civil society, NGOs, uh, 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 governments, and businesses, we should ask, add as a fifth type of personal organization, uh, troublemakers or, or authors. Uh, um, and that's, that's how Chris, uh, Chris Skinner, uh, our speaker, has introduced himself. Uh, and it's great to have new faces. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly what Chris will talk about. I'm sure he will be. I don't know if being a troublemaker means that uh, uh, doing something different than the original text uh, uh, is, is part of the plan. Um, but uh, he has just a, a new book out. Uh, and although he's a frequent visitor to Helsinki, I believe he has more books than visits to Helsinki under his belt. So it will be really interesting to get. Uh, a slightly different perspective, I hope, uh, uh, um, from, from what we are used to. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome our keynote, first keynote for uh, the second day, Chris Skinner. Thank you, Timo. I would hope you would have COVID, if I'm going to avoid that. Um, good morning. Welcome. I'm glad that you got up inside after the sauna and the events of last evening, which I would like to join, but I thought I should stay fresh, so I went to bed early, which is not a good thing to do on the longest day, and when there's daylight all night long. Um, so Timo doesn't know what I'm going to talk about, neither do I, I just made it up. But basically, I'm going to talk about data in the context of regulation, and um, that was my brief, just to be clear. So that's why I'm talking about data and regulation. Um, I write every day something about finance and technology and regulation and the economy and society. And the reason I do that every day is because I'm a real boring person. Um, but it produces books, of which my 17th book of business has just been released, Digital for Good. It's about how technology and finance can make the world better. Equally, I produced five children's books about the candy group, which is something that the pandemic lockdown forced me to do because my children wanted something new. Um, but when I thought about the idea of data and regulation, I was thinking about the cancel culture. I thought, what if your financial provider cancelled you? And that's actually quite a critical question, because if you find that you're cancelled, you don't exist. Now this is something that human traffickers deal with every day because that's the whole idea about trafficking people. Which is, if, if they get you, the first thing they will do is rip up your identity. And your identity is often a physical document, a passport, or a, a driving license. And they'll burn it. And then you don't exist. But what if your financial provider cancelled you? Or what if someone stole your identity? Which often happens these days because of the network. And the network is actually creating a whole new way of providing finance in three forms, which is centralised, decentralised and distributed. Decentralised and distributed are actually related. Um, there's a nuances here, and I don't want to go through those because I don't have time. But most people trust a centralised authority because they believe that gives them security. Libertarians don't trust centralised authorities because they believe they monitor and track them. What's your preference? Do you want to be with an authorised identity or with an unauthorized or network authorized identity. Your choice these days. And there's nuances between each. But if you take the centralized authority, then typically it means that you are a bank and you have a banking license. And old banks are pretty much hated, so new banks are loved. They're cool. They have coral cards. They're much better to deal with, aren't they? Or are they? Um, you get a regulated license from the central authority, the regulator. So you're now a regulated financial institution. And yet, because you're regulated, 
it makes life much more difficult. Which is why Monzo, which is one of the coolest banks in Britain, which is not where I'm from, I live in Poland, just to be clear, and I run a Nordic group and I come across Helsinki quite often, but also Oslo and Stockholm and Reykjavik and many other cities of the world. But um, in Britain, Monzo was very cool until they started to close customers' accounts arbitrarily. And they've been doing this quite regularly for the past couple of years. Mainly because the central authority who gave them the banking license said that you haven't got the appropriate data on the customer. And so we don't think you know who your customers are. It's called KYC, you know your customer. And it's because Monzo moved from a prepaid card to a full licensed bank and migrated the prepaid cardholders to the bank. It's made their customers quite angry. Not the ones who didn't have their accounts closed, but they're quite happy. The ones who had their accounts closed, of which there's now 13,000 in the Facebook group, which says there's actually a lot more in the real world, are not happy. Because they won't explain why they closed their accounts. I can explain it, it's to do with the fact they haven't got the full documentation, the full data about the customer. And it's not just you know, a challenger bank like Monzo, it's old banks like NatWest. They also have a Facebook group with thousands of people. And um, the problem is when the institution cancels you, you're stuffed. Can you feed your kids? Can you go to the supermarket? Can you get on the bus? So that's the traditional centralised institution. And it's not just in the UK, by the way, it's actually all over the world. I actually see this everywhere. Um, and it's to do with new challenger banks do not understand the regulations. Equally, old banks do not understand the regulations. Regulations change every 12 minutes. If you're a global bank, regulations change every 12 minutes, somewhere in the world. How you keep up with that, I have no idea. So, what we then do is say, let's go distribute and decentralize. Let's take the data and give it to me. I own my identity. The government and the bank does not own my identity. It's me. I own what I do. And I'll do whatever I want because I'm a libertarian. And so I'll put all my life savings in cryptocurrencies. <laughs> Mistake. <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah. I've been through those mistakes quite often, actually. I had a lot of money on Mt. Gox, which you may not have even heard of, but in 2014 it disappeared. There's a court case ongoing in Japan to try and get the cryptocurrency back. It was a Bitcoin exchange. And I was stupid. I put my money on the exchange and left it there. I should have put it into a cold wallet. But, hey-ho, I learned a lesson. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Quadriga. Um, this is an interesting story about a cryptocurrency exchange in Canada where the founder allegedly died in India and he was the only person who had the password to the cryptocurrencies on the exchange. Three hundred fifty million dollars disappeared. And um, you may remember that there was a uh, attack on the DAO, the distributed autonomous organization of Ethereum. If you don't know about that, go and Google it. But they lost all their money. So you need to put it into a regulated exchange. Which goes back to then, it's not decentralized, it's actually regulated. And it's a central authority that says Coinbase is okay. Except they may be going bankrupt. If you didn't see the other day, they said that the first call on their organization would be the uh, creditors who were businesses, and the retail investors would come last. You may put it in something like the tariffs as a stable coin, except it's become unstable, <laughs> it's disappeared. Uh, you may put it in an exchange like Celsius, who then say, we cancel you, cancel culture, you can't take your money off our exchange anymore because we said so. It's a central authority, it's not decentralized at all. The same with Binance. 
And what amused me is that the best way to deal with this is squeeze therapy. <laughs> yeah. I've lost all my money. It's a wild west. How do you deal with it? What do you do? It's my data. It's my money. My money is now my, my data. Money is data. It's always been data, except that historically it's physical. I had a passport. I had proof in a physical form with a paper receipt. You don't have that anymore. And to be honest, it's all about governance. The libertarians hate me because I always said that you can't have money without government. But they never asked me who is the government. They assumed I meant Finland's central bank, for example. I didn't. What I meant is you need governance. You need a government over the, the, the data. Someone you can resort to as the last resort when you have an issue and say, I want my data back. I want my money back. Where's the governance? The governance of the internet is the network, the people. And again, to put it in context, we look at Europe, of which, with my accent, I'm no longer a member of, although I live in Poland, so I am. I told you. Europe doesn't exist. There's no borders. The network doesn't recognize any country. Finland doesn't exist. I mean, Finland is Sweden. Oh, sorry. Of course it's not. Could be. Whatever. Borders don't exist on the network. So who governs the network? Who governs my data on the network? It's not Europe, it's not Finland, it's not the central bank. It's me. It's us. It's the people. That's the power of the network. That's the reason why decentralized and distributed is so key in today's world. And the friction between government currencies, fiat currencies, and cryptocurrencies, and stable coins, and central bank digital currencies, and it's what you believe in. Money is just what you believe in. It doesn't exist. It's been made up. Money has got a complete illusion, except that it's quite important if you have a mortgage or kids or whatever. You need to pay your bills. But money's just made up. And today money is just data, and it's my data. So who owns my data? That's the key question. Who owns my data? I own my data, except I don't. At the moment, the bank owns my data, the government owns my data, corporations own my data, Facebook owns my data. If I let them, I'm not sure I trust them. In the traditional centralized institutions, this know your customer issue is a critical issue because it's all about having a proof that you are you. That's the reason why you have to have a passport, a driving license, utility bills, and things that when the bank opens an account for you can show that you are you. And that's what everybody, particularly in the criminal underworld, wants to get a hold of. Because if I can prove that I am you, then I've got your money. Open banking is changing some of these things. And what's interesting for me is that open banking, which is saying banks share data between institutions and trusted third parties, means that there's a lot of data being ported around the world about who am I? How do we control that? That's the big fear of everyone. Do we want open banking? A lot of media says the last thing we want is open banking. To be honest, I love open banking because then I can include a huge part of the platform of the open network to give me better services, but I just don't want to leak my data. And I own my data in that context. Don't use the same password on every site. There's a great sketch, sketch uh, from a comedian about um, passwords, which is basically you start 
you know, 10, 15 years ago at Haskell. And then they say, oh, you need to add a number, so you put one on the end. And they say, you need to use a special character, so you go one exclamation mark. Are you an idiot? Because people know that you do that. They're particularly criminals. Make sure you use stronger passwords. In fact, why do we even have passwords? That's ridiculous. You know, you can have um, fingerprints, face IDs, but more importantly, eventually we'll get to the stage where we have DNA, so you can spit on your back. You know, that, that works for me. <laughs> Many of us do. And then you may say, I don't even trust my bank anyway, I don't want open banking, I want to deal with something else. Which, if you did deal with something else, you're either laughing or you're crying. Depends on what year you invested. I invested a long time ago, um, a little bit, and then lost it all, and then invested a little bit more, and I lost it all, and then invested a little bit more. You know, in fact, 4 million bitcoins have been lost forever. Which, when you think there's only 21 million max, that's a lot of the network that's been lost forever. And a lot of value being lost forever. That's 20% of the investment, which, depending on the day of the week, is 20 billion, 20 trillion, 20 million. <laughs> I don't know. You know but it's lost. An IT worker in Britain, it's a famous story, throughout its hard drive. And you can see the date, 2013, and it had all these Bitcoins on it, which at that time were worth $350 million. Today they'd be worth maybe $350 million. Can you find them? No. They're gone. Or, um, forgot the password. Silly boy. The thing is that with all these horror stories about decentralized and distributed currencies, in the data world of the network, it will come true. There's no reason why companies are building these systems and getting millions and billions of dollars in investment in startups if this is not going to change the world. It will change the world. The distributed and decentralized financial network of data is what we need. Because you can't have a global network if you don't have a global currency. You cannot have an internet if you do not have an internet currency that does not recognize government's borders. And the governments are struggling with this immensely because they don't know how to regulate this. And it's all about data, security, identity, and money. How do you regulate this? when it doesn't recognize that you exist. And the average person on the street may go, oh, I'm not bothered about this. I will take my euro and spend it in the shop. Except that a third of people are invested in digital currencies in most countries. It depends on what country is, whether it's more or less. But at least a third of people are playing with different currencies. Because they can, because the network allows them to. That's today's world. And they're always going to be open to criminals who want to get their money. And that's the regulatory challenge, which is how do you make sure that people can play with their money on the network securely and not lose it all? Are we going to bail out those people who lost on cryptocurrencies in the last month or two? No. And yet we did in 2008. Why is the regulator not dealing with this? It's often because the regulator doesn't know what to do. Because the regulator is always looking at what's happened and not what's about to happen. The regulator is always looking in their rear window. And objects in the mirror appear to be losing. Except you could look at this two ways. You could say, is the regulation in the driving seat, or is the regulator the police car behind? What do you think? Thank you. It's time for questions. If there are any questions, yes, that's right.
Any questions? Yes. Um, get your questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, as always, you have you have gone around a few bends here since I heard you last time, and, and you have new views. Uh, uh, I'm no I'm no f friend of, of cryptocurrencies myself. I have kept my fingers away from that, and I <laughs> so so that's not perhaps the the thing I wanted to ask about. But then, what we are doing now here and in many countries in Europe, and also the European Commission is self sort of identity. That is a very, very focus on, on getting security. And the IP, the foundation, I'm sure you know about them, they have built up a model that looks like taking away a major chunk of crime and, uh, and uh, adding privacy and productivity of like 36% of GDP, according to McKinsey. So, what do you think about trust over IP? Have you looked into it and have you looked into self sort of identity? That's my question. So, I in the Nordic region, actually, identity is um, something that the region is leading. Um, and from my Nordic group, the digital identity has been a big subject of many of our meetings. I think the challenge we have is how do you make them uh, interoperable, cross-border? Um, and even more so, what's the European Union going to do about this in terms of creating a Euro ID? And if I'm British, I'm not part of the European Union, so what does that mean in terms of identification? Um, and again, it goes back to all about the data, which is what creates a portable, interoperable ID that's digital. You know, the fact that I go around these days with a physical passport is actually quite ridiculous. You know, I find it stupid. And I was presenting in the 2000s and said that people will end up with chips inside. I'm pretty sure it will, like our dogs and cats and kids. But, um, but yeah, why don't we have a chip inside? Because then I could be uh, in interoperable without any identification at all. I just walk. And they know it's me. Because um, I have my ID on a chip inside my hand or arm or whatever. Um, and in Sweden, they've done that. In Sweden, they have digital IDs. But people don't want them because they go, oh, and the government knows where I am all the time and can track and trace me everywhere. And yet they're not active chips. They're only active in terms of when you hold them against the scanner. So I think we'll have this debate for a long time. And it's a little bit like um, Minority Report with Tom Cruise, Steven Spielberg film, which stays in my mind because I, I wondered why he didn't ask me to be involved. <laughs> Is that too much? Well, I actually knew a lot about what was going on, but Steven Spielberg did consult with MIT and a lot of futuristic institutions to create the film back in 2000. Um, and that's the reason why you have these Tesla like cars that operate automatically without drivers, self driving electric, electric vehicles. Um, and there's always that moment in the Mao where Tom Cruise is recognised by his eyeballs. Um, you know, that's the world we're moving to. We haven't got there yet, but when we talk about electronic identities, the fact that if I'm in Finland, if I went to Sweden and they wouldn't know who I was, means that an EID here is irrelevant if you travel. And there's the question, how many of us travel? Did you travel? We all travel. We're going to end up with chips inside. Well, that was my that was a question I had. Is the chip then the solution to protecting yourself from being cancelled? Uh, I'm not sure because the chip is what we have right now, but we're already moving beyond that. I mean, with quantum computing and artificial uh, intelligence. And so, you know, the biometric, the DNA, the chip, whatever it is, will eventually combine. And we're going to go through stages. Right now, we're very much at the biometric stage, which, thank goodness, we are. And yet, 25 years ago, people said biometrics don't work. You get too many false positives, too many identifications that are not accurate. Um, and yet today, you know, most of our smartphones will use our face and our fingerprints as recognition. Uh, and the banks and the financial institutions will accept that 
for opening and accessing your account. Um, give it another 25 years, who knows? It, it could very well be um, yourselves or something. There we go. Thank you very much. That's time's up. And uh, thank you very much.